There are moments in history where survival hinged on the smallest, simplest pieces of equipment. Not rifles, not rations, but a single candle. Across the Soviet Union, during the harshest winters of the 20th century, heat wasn't something anyone could take for granted. Cities struggling with fuel shortages, outposts cut off by snowstorms, and soldiers stationed in drafty barracks had to find ways to keep frostbite at bay, using whatever they had. And while most people today would never think of a candle as anything more than an emergency light source, for Soviet civilians and soldiers, it became something else entirely. A compact, improvised heat device used to warm small interior spaces through the night when temperatures outside dropped low enough to freeze metal tools solid. This method wasn't glamorous, it wasn't comfortable, but it worked well enough to become part of the small but enduring law of Soviet winter survival. The method worked because it used heat retention instead of open-air flame heating. A single candle on its own cannot warm a room. The Soviet trick was never about the flame itself, but about controlling how its heat radiated. Soviet households and field units used a simple physical principle. If you trap heat around a candle instead of letting it escape upward, it accumulates warms the air around it, and slowly releases that heat outward. The most common setup involved placing a candle beneath an inverted clay pot or metal container elevated slightly above the surface. The pot absorbed the flame's heat, stored it, and radiated it outward at a much steadier and warmer rate than a naked flame ever could. When placed in a small enclosed area, such as an interior corner, a trench shelter, or a cramped barracks room, this slow release could noticeably raise the temperature around sleeping quarters. The key was not flame size, but thermal mass. A clay pot or metal vessel with enough thickness acted like a primitive radiator. It's critical to point out that many Soviet methods were born out of desperation rather than safety. Housing throughout the USSR often lacked reliable heating, and soldiers guarding remote outposts used whatever they could scrounge. The goal wasn't to create luxury. It was to avoid freezing through the night. Knowing why the method worked helps modern viewers understand the physics without needing to recreate historically dangerous setups. The technique relied on creating microclimates within larger cold spaces. A Soviet soldier stationed in a drafty barracks during winter didn't try to heat the entire building using candles. That would have been impossible. Instead, he used the candle method to warm the immediate space around his bunk or sitting area, essentially shrinking the heated zone to a manageable size. This was especially common in frontier stations where barracks walls were poorly insulated and gaps let in gusts of cold air. The candle and pot method produced a warm pocket about the size of a sleeping bag's footprint. If you were resting, writing, or repairing gear, that small rise in temperature could be enough to keep your hands flexible and your breath from crystallizing. This strategy is still relevant today. Instead of trying to heat entire rooms, modern off-grid families often focus on microclimates, warming only the spaces they actively use. While you should never place open flames near flammable materials, you can create safe microclimates using modern heat-retaining materials such as stoneware, insulated containers, or electric heating elements powered by battery banks. The idea remains the same. Concentrate heat where it matters rather than wasting energy on the whole room. 
For anyone interested in the principles behind the Soviet method, the safest modern approach is to use heat storing materials warmed by controlled safe sources. For instance, heating bricks or ceramic stones on an induction plate or electric warmer and placing them inside a metal container or enclosed thermal mass can slowly radiate warmth through the night without any flame involved. This captures the historical logic, thermal retention, without the historical risk of indoor fire or oxygen depletion. Another safe adaptation is using insulated partitions to shrink the effective heated area, just as Soviet soldiers did with blankets and makeshift barriers. If you're dealing with a cold room during a power outage, partitioning the space and using safe controlled heating sources dramatically reduces energy use while maximizing warmth. You're not copying the candle method itself, you're copying its tactical mindset. Conserve heat, store heat, and release it slowly into a confined space. Why the Soviet method endures as a fascinating historical example is, well, not because it's a perfect heating solution. The reason this technique still circulates among history enthusiasts and survivalists isn't because it's flawless. It's because it shows how ordinary people used physics, improvisation and resourcefulness to survive brutal environments. The Soviet Union's winters are, you know, legendary for their severity, and yet millions of people lived through those winters using simple tricks like this one. It's a reminder that survival knowledge does not always come from grand inventions. Sometimes it comes from understanding how to coax utility out of basic materials. There's also a cultural aspect. Throughout the Soviet era, people were accustomed to rationing, shortages and unreliable infrastructure. Methods like this became part of everyday experience, passed along in factory dormitories, rural settlements and military barracks. Today, looking back at these techniques allows us to appreciate the resilience of those who endured conditions most modern households would not tolerate for even a single night. The Soviet candle method is less a blueprint to replicate and more a case study in human ingenuity under extreme conditions. It shows how much can be achieved when people fully understand the materials in front of them and the environment around them. If you found this deep dive into historical heating ingenuity valuable, make sure to subscribe to the channel, share the video and help bring these forgotten survival methods back into modern understanding, safely and responsibly.